Reformation Fellowship provides support and fellowship to all who would stand for the reformation of Christ's church worldwide. We long to see the church revitalized by the gospel and seek to encourage all who share that vision. We gather together for gospel-hearted fellowship around gospel-minded theology. We are a ministry of unity. Greetings and welcome back to the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. If you were not here for the last episode, you will want to go back and listen to that before listening any more to this episode, because this is part two. This is part two from Michael Reeves and his call to the church, a call to reformation. So please go back, listen to that, then come listen to this as we continue to hear from Dr. Michael Reeves, president of Union lecturer in theology, historical theology, and church history at Union School of Theology, as he calls the church, invites us to pray towards, work towards, partner towards, long for reformation in our day and in our world. And you can imagine that self-improvement through reading and study will do the trick. So it, and the thing is that can look great. It can have all the look of Christian health and zeal, but without the pain of being undone as a sinner and crying like Isaiah, woe to me, under the the scrutinizing light of the glory of God. And you know, I think there's a real irony here. Because evangelicals are... We always tend to be skeptical of Christian ritualism, uh, opposing the superstition of nominalism that mistakes mere practice, like church attendance, for real knowledge of God. So, for example, uh, the Catholic idea that you can receive grace ex opere operato, essentially automatically, as you simply receive um, the, uh, the bread or water, That idea that grace could be received essentially automatically strikes evangelicals as an affront to the gospel, denying our need for personal faith. But I think we can treat the Bible the same way as if grace comes automatically through the simple reading of Scripture. So others go on pilgrimages and perform penances, but we do our regular reading ritual. And sometimes I think that the ritual is so superstitious, you could do it with a book upside down. Just crack it open, done the job, right? And so worship becomes no more than the bare right of a daily quiet time, which is mechanical, heartless, devoid of any real dependence upon God, adoration of him. And when evangelicals fall for that and fall into the Pharisees' error, eerie resemblances to the Pharisees start to appear. Instead of treasuring Scripture as a revealing mirror, as James talks about it in James 1, we can start using Scripture as a weapon to beat others or as a platform on which to parade our own brilliance. Especially once you've done a couple of years study and you're just aware of how awesome you now are. And arrogance mushrooms as blind to the exposing light of scripture we become masters of its words. And so where scripture is allowed to be an end in itself, we become proud, and I think what will happen is you will go out and any preaching that is done by any who become preachers will become making people experts in scripture. And such preaching might make people more moral, 
but what it's actually doing is creating scribes, not disciples. It's creating a people, oh, very aware of all their biblical knowledge, but very unaware of the depth of their problem. Puffed up, self-reliant, they're not humbled, they're not dependent, they're not staggered at the mercy of God. They are not made worshippers and I love Calvin's, I think, almost first self-description as a Christian, a lover of Jesus Christ. And as well as self-satisfied, that sort of evangelicalism is going to look very cerebral. And I wonder if that's sometimes where the accusation that evangelicalism is very middle class comes from. It's actually talking about the cerebral nature of it that it's primarily concerned with knowledge. Because the cardinal sin is ignorance. And I think that that might surprise people because evangelicalism has got a reputation for being anti-intellectual, anti-theology, right? I don't know if you've received a bit of flack for wanting to study theology, people thinking, careful, you know where that can go, don't you? You'll lose your faith, all that sort of... Evangelicalism's got that sort of reputation. But it is very possible, while evangelicalism may be known for being shallow, it's very possible to be cerebral and shallow. And actually, if the Bible is mere information that we have to ingest, we have all the more reason to want it to be simple because it makes our expertise more possible, doesn't it? Great. If it's simple, I become a master quicker. Good. And the horrible result is an evangelical culture that is simultaneously smug and superficial, with nothing to be smug about. The gospel gets treated as the ABC for outsiders and initiates, and we can all say we've moved on. We can bathe in the comfort of a knowledge that no longer drives us to our knees. And I think that's the tell. That's the question, friends, to pose to yourself this year. Does your reading of Scripture drive you to your knees? Does it drive you to Christ? Specifically, does it drive you to him in private prayer? Because... That we pray is not the issue. Hypocrites love to pray. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. No, public prayer is not immediate proof of health. The question is whether you draw near to God in prayer to worship and praise him Yes, together with brothers and sisters in church. But is it also the natural outflow of your soul that you couldn't prevent on a Tuesday morning? Do you go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret? Because it is that unseen outflow of the soul that is a key distinguishing mark that demonstrates the difference between a saint and a Pharisee. Pose that to yourself as a question this year. You know, some 50 odd years ago, Martin Lloyd-Jones went so far as to say This issue is the chief plague of the evangelical faith. I'll quote him. He said, If I understand the condition of the church today, and indeed during the last 50 years or so, I would say its great trouble has been that it has fallen into this particular error. Striking thing to say from 
an evangelical leader of renown like that. Lloyd-Jones was actually looking at this problem under its historical label called Sandemanianism. And uh, Sandemanianism, I'm assuming you've probably not heard of it, it was named after the 18th century uh, Scottish pastor Robert Sandeman. And this was a rationalistic sect that he championed that really thrived in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. And the Sandemanians were known for their belief in the fact that saving truth is, I quote their words, bare belief of the bare truth. And Sandeman's argument is a really interesting one. It's a very evangelical Protestant argument. Sandeman's argument was that faith becomes a work if it is anything more than bare assent to the truth of the gospel. It's really evangelical reason. He's, he's wanting to protect the absolute freeness of the gospel. So he's saying if saving faith involves any active leaning of the soul upon Christ... Well, that's a work, isn't it? Because you're doing something. So f saving faith can't be that, or else it's a work. We know that we're justified by faith alone, not by our works. And so faith, Sandeman judged, must be the mere intellectual acknowledgement that the gospel is true. But it cannot involve active trust in or treasuring of Christ. And so with that belief, the Sandemanians sought to be orthodox. They sought to be assiduous students of scripture. They had the deepest commitment to biblical exposition and preaching. But underneath that impressive veneer lay a heart-shriveling sickness. And that spiritual withering was felt by the Welsh preacher, Christmas Evans, um, who for a while um, fell under the Sandemanian spell. And Evans found himself, he said, in the grip of a, he said, I had a cold heart towards Christ and his sacrifice and the work of his spirit. A cold heart in the pulpit, in secret prayer, and in the study. This doctrine of Sandemanianism left me in the cold and sterile regions of spiritual frost. Even Bible study can land you there. And there should be no surprise that Evans felt that because saving faith is not mere knowledge of Scripture. If you treat the Bible like that, it's like treating a prescription as if it were the medicine itself. It's like treating a signpost as if it were your real destination. Scripture is meant for looking through at Christ. The Scriptures do not have life in themselves, just as they do not point to themselves. They are the word of Christ able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Their purpose is not simply that we might know about Christ or even that we might consider him but that we might, John 5 verse 40, come to him for life. And I just want to clarify one thing, if I can. I, I realize I may sound as if I'm saying something that is often heard, um, that yes, we should see Christ in all of Scripture. Um, that's become a staple theme of evangelical books and conferences, and in many ways I'm glad of that, um, because it means we're all clear that the Scriptures are written, all the Scriptures are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. But that's not actually my point here. 
I'm not saying the point of Scripture is to see Christ in all Scripture. Because the danger of the Pharisees lies deeper than that. You can diligently study how all the Scriptures proclaim Christ. You can get to Christ as the end point of every sermon in Judges and Genesis and Psalms and still not actually come to him and still not actually preach him. Because you can preach about Christ without preaching Christ. Seeing Christ in all of Scripture can be an exegetical game we play in which we show Christ as the solution to the textual puzzle. Wasn't that fun? We got there. Hey, aren't we quite clever for getting there? But preachers can then fail to introduce and actually offer Christ. Readers of the Bible can assent to the understanding that Christ is the right answer, but not come to him, trust him, or worship him. So better exegesis is always a good thing. Yes, yes, let's do better exegesis. But actually to think that better exegesis is the silver bullet is to fall into the trap of the Pharisees who believe that ignorance was really the depth of the problem. According to Jesus, our real, the real bottom of the fountain of our problem is the sinful bent of our hearts. You refuse to come to me to have life. So dear students, it is not enough to search scripture diligently. You can be like Apollos, the young Apollos who was competent in the scriptures, and yet all the supposed depth of your scriptural knowledge is not the same thing as life. Your study can be a faithless, self-aggrandizing, self-promoting hobby. And therein lies what Lloyd-Jones called our great trouble. We confuse mere knowledge with trust in Christ, enjoyment of him growth in him so dear friends to avoid hypocrisy and work at reformation in your own life stop looking down this year stop looking down at scripture to master it stop looking down on others and stop looking down to others for glory instead look up look up through scripture to see the glory of god in the face of christ crucified there in the face of christ crucified see your condemnation as a sinner see what you deserve See how inglorious you naturally are and be humbled. And then see his beautiful glory. His mercy, his righteousness, his loving kindness towards you while you were still a sinner. And then find the relief of letting go of your own glory and not seeking it from others but enjoying his glory and seeking only the glory that comes from him let's pray Our Father, we lift ourselves to you, aware of how the leaven of the Pharisees 
is so close a danger and temptation for us. But the spirit you've put in us makes us loathe the hypocrisy that otherwise comes so naturally to us. And we long to be rid of it. And so we pray, open our eyes. Open our eyes to see the glory of God in the face of Christ crucified. That his glory may expose us so that we see ourselves honestly and reveal you so that we do not merely talk about you in the third person. We do not nearly, merely know about you, but we love you, trust you, fear you, adore you. And we pray these things in the name of our great Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to stand and sing once more. We're going to sing um, that hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And uh, it might be a really good prayer for us this year as we go into study. Great prayer every time we open up scripture. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing. That we're not just being informed, but our, our hearts are being tuned. And later in the hymn, there's those lyrics that very honestly admit, I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Wander off my own direction. Here's my heart. Take and seal it. So let's stand and sing this great uh, hymn of prayer. Come thou fount of every Take and seal it, seal it for.